some odd, very odd things turn up in Hortus. <laughs> um, it simply would never find a home elsewhere. Digging with the Duchess, it must be the only gardening spoof uh, <laughs> published anywhere in the world. It's outrageously funny and um, it has its devotees, rather like the archers. Yeah. And people love to follow this ridiculous uh, Duchess smoking her 40 caps and full strength a day and no stranger to the gin um, and the gardening gloves. So um, she alone, I know, uh, sells Hortus to a certain, to a certain group of readers. <laughs> And welcome to a Merry Christmas edition of Talking Dirty, overlapping, I suppose, with our latest in a series focusing on the wonders at East Ruston Old Vicarage on the East UK coast, month by month. And uh, we've had October and November, obviously, over at East Ruston Old Vicarage. Alan Gray had to share the wonders, the splendours of December in his garden. Though before we get stuck into that, I should apologise if things look a bit different, if they sound a bit different yet again. It seems that every time Alan and I sit down to record one of these, one of us has some kind of issue. But so today, my, my laptop won't work this time. Yeah, last time it was Alan. So uh, we're on my phone. I don't know how to use the app. So let's just hope it records. That's that's really it. We're just going to talk plants and hope for the best. But anyway, how how the devil are you, you handsome fellow? <laughs> I'm absolutely fine. How are you over there? You're looking very Christmassy in Cambridgeshire, I have to say. But it's not it's not a um a bright bright bling Christmas because your tree. <laughs> I'm sure there's plenty of bling on there, but your tree actually melds into the background rather well, and it's it's quite subtle. It all it, it complements your jumper with those lovely sort of pinks and reds and things. It's very Christmassy, very seasonal. Subtle is not a word often associated with me. I think probably it's because everything is so technicolor; it all merges into one rainbow effect. But you this is a right. tree. This tree took us hours to decorate. We're those people who get really into it. Christmas music on, baby, in you know, asleep in the evening. We spent hours meticulously moving decorations around. So uh, who knows what will happen when the child starts decorating the tree? But currently, <laughs> uh, it's. It's Peter and I, and we thoroughly enjoyed it. So we're getting fully into festive spirits. And I suppose um, in your garden, you've had uh, something to help you look festive, if not feel festive, and that is a touch of frost. We have, and this is a, the most unusual, you see, because for so many years, we haven't had any frost until either just before or just after Christmas. And this year, Dame Nature, as, as usual, she had a trick up her sleeve, and we just <laughs> had to suffer it, for goodness sake. It's no good getting upset by all these things but you know it is it was rather disparaging when suddenly you know you suddenly have minus three and minus three degrees in this garden is virtually unheard of but you know that is the climate that we live with today it's completely unpredictable um and you know you what can you do i i ask myself what can you do and i ask myself what is hardiness two questions one you can do nothing about it you can do your best but you can't really do anything about it and two is Hardiness out the window, you know, it, it just doesn't it, just, it it doesn't compute anymore. It's absolutely ridiculous. So we just go ahead and we do what we usually do here. If we're planting um, using plants that are fairly half hardy, we put them in as sheltered a position as we possibly can. And I always think that people probably neglect the bottoms of hedges because bottoms of hedges, especially on the south facing slope, are very, very um, good places for half hardy plants. When we first came to East Ruston 50 years ago, and we were walking around the lanes here, and outside a cottage, I don't know whether I've told you this tale before, but outside a cottage was this bank, south-facing bank, and it was just covered with these white daisies, huge white daisies, and I thought, what earth are they? <laughs> and I looked up, and it was a plant called Demorphotheca in those days, which is now Osteospermum, and it had these shoots, and it had little... Um, adventitious roots all the way along the shoot so it creeps it's a south african daisy it creeps and it roots as it goes so it gets bigger and bigger and bigger anyway this dear little old lady was saw me sort of poking about outside her hedge and she said oh good morning can i help you or something like this and i said this daisy is absolutely wonderful and she said oh it just grows everywhere i mean take some have some so she gave me a handful of these little bits and we've had it ever since but that was a lesson in in you know hardiness if you like this half hardy plant underneath the shelter of a hedge, which is like a rain shadow, it was growing beautifully and it was loving it. And this probably was maybe late March, beginning of April. 
something like that. So it's just emerging from its winter rest and it was flowering. And, you know, that's what we have to do today. If we're going to grow half hardies, you grow them against a fence, a hedge, a wall, a sheltered nook, a, a corner. Don't forget, though, underneath trees is quite a sheltered place as well. I mean, we've got some oaks yeah. in the in our little secret garden. And I get very cross because I put seats in this secret garden in the summer because it's a lovely shady nook. But the pigeons go and sit on the branches and poo on the pla on the seats. <laughs> so this is constant battle. You know, people don't want to sit on a, a seat covered with bird mess. So uh, anyway, there we are. But it's a lovely sheltered place. Um, and that's, I use that underneath those uh, spreading branches there's a home oak there as well which is evergreen underneath those spreading branches i use that as a step from the greenhouse to, to taking plants out of the greenhouse and hardening them off under there because it gives it a little bit of night shelter when the temperatures are apt to drop but yes it's it is that it's that winter thing and i've got i've got a little box of goodies here so shall we start shall we start talking about those and we'll yes. see where the laptop and the phone takes us <laughs> well, we will. I, I really had to stop and sort of think twice when you said it, it hit minus three in your garden, because, of course, yeah. in the very depths of the cold winter last year, you only hit minus four. And I'm yeah. fairly confident that when we had that really cold night uh, here in Cambridge, it was minus four. And normally we're much colder than you. But of course, the yeah. cold front did seem to come along the east. So I, I think you were actually you know, battling us for who would be colder for once, which is very <laughs> yeah, but, but Graham always says uh, the worst cold nights for us are, are the, is when the low pressure is leaving and it drags all that cold air up from Cambridgeshire across us. <laughs> <laughs> so, all I'm going to say, thought, is Maria. So <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> You're very welcome. <laughs> and it does happen when, you know, when, when, when the thing goes easterly, the front goes easterly. Yeah. yeah, I was sort of poking about in the garden uh, yesterday, actually, and I found a few little treasures, um, which I always do. But um, one is a common old thing, really. And I don't know whether you remember that Martin Davy always has a love of Viburnum Tynus. Yes. Well, this is a form of uh, Viburnum Tynus. And I don't know whether you can see that, but in actual fact, it, there's an awful lot of pink in there. Yes, beautiful. Um, uh, Martin Davy, former head of horticulture at Eastern and Otley College. So that was sort of the East Anglian place you'd go to to, to learn horticulture. Loved by Natural. Burnham. We always would sort of, you in particular, mock him for being such a fan of a, a, a ubiquitous municipal plant, I suppose. Well, I suppose that's what it is. Isn't it? But if you analyse the plant itself, it's a pretty dull looking plant. The leaves are not very bright. They're not shiny. They're not cheerful in any way. But this to flower at this time of the year and it will go right the way through until early spring I think is lovely I remember when we when we were children we used to have um, on, on mothering Sunday we used to pick I mean you you can't do it today it's not le not legal today but we used to pick bunches of primroses and all sorts of things anything we could get hold of um and in the house next door to us they had a viburnum tinus and we always picked you know three sprigs of this each and you used to take your bunch and take it to the church and you had a mothering Sunday service and this Flowers got distributed to the various mothers. I don't know what mine did with hers, but something, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> you know, suddenly the garden here is bereft of leaves. And I think that's what that frost does, because we have, we have, I have a barometer. We have two barometers, actually, in actual fact. And the barometers are white mulberries. And they're the mulberries that you fed the leaves to silkworms rather than the black mulberry, which is the mulberry you eat. By the way, if you put a, put a black mulberry in your garden, do beware because they drop their fruits. And if you sit down on the grass and you sit on these fruits, they stain your clothes horribly. And it can be very embarrassing if you're wearing cream. However, <laughs> my white mulberries, there are, I know when we've had a very cold night because they hang on to their leaves. They go, as somebody once said, a rich butter yellow, um, lovely, these lovely yellow leaves. And overnight, a sharp frost, they all drop. Well, 95% of them drop. Um, and it is, it's quite alarming because you were in the garden yesterday and the leaves were on the trees. And the next morning you walk out and the leaves are on the ground and the trees are bare. And it changes completely because there's suddenly there's light. Mm. There would have been shade and you've got this golden carpet until, of course, they, they start to look disgusting and sleaze creeps in. So we've <laughs> had to, I mean, talking of sleaze, we've had to, um, outside my dining room window, which is totally impractical, but it's there anyway, we have a clump of the false banana musa basdew. 
And that normally on the south side of the house remains looking fresh until into the new year. But of course, with that frost, all of these huge, great paddle-shaped leaves, they blacken. Mm. Please. Couldn't have it. Couldn't put up with it. <laughs> so dear Bridget went up and she locked them all up the other day. So thank goodness for that. So, you know, it's constant, tidy, tidy, tidy. Um, anyway, and you can... mentioned the light, you know, suddenly coming down. Yeah. I mean, at least the good news is that light is there to help bring all of the next treasures on. Yes, exactly that. The tree fellas came in a month ago, I suppose, and we topped some eucalyptus. Um, we've done it before to them and they'd grown probably 25 feet. And of course, we dip, We I've learned my lesson, I say, because we should chop them back on a biennial basis, perhaps, or triennial basis, once every two or three years, maybe, um, when whilst they're manageable to keep chopped back. And once they get too big, you have to get somebody in to do it, and it costs a lot of money. I mean, and all those eucalyptus that I said that we topped, and we, I mean, the, all those branches get chopped up, and, the, and if they're too big, the logs, they're split, and they're st we store them for three years, so they're entirely dry. We've got this cycle going on and there's wood piles in certain areas of the garden. You've seen them. And um, I tell you what's fascinating about wood piles. We have the remains of an original wood pile that I left near the entrance gate, which is in, in shade. It's quite open shade. It's tall trees. Um, so it's not very dark, but it's, it's nevertheless in shade. And what fascinates me about this log pile is that it change, it's changed over the years. A, as the logs have rotted, it's shrunk. And it's home to all manner of little invertebrates and mice and voles and that kind of thing. And, and lovely insects as well. And the logs gradually, they deteriorate. But then mosses start growing on them. And you get mosses and lichens or lichens, however you want to say it. And you get other plants that seed themselves in. And we've got Japanese anemones. There's um, a very dark Japanese anemone there. That, that and, and with this moss, it's like a little enchanted garden of its own, if you know what I mean. Primroses and violets and foxgloves and all those things will seed in. And it's just a lovely thing to do. So if somebody wants a project and it's a lovely thing for a child to do, because you, if you've got a shady area, I mean, I know, I know what I was like when I was a child. And I used to love this sort of thing of being given my own spot that other people didn't go to. So if you've got a little nook in your garden, you can give to a child or a grandchild. I think it's absolutely lovely. And you can talk about, you know, nature and the way things happen um, and, you know, make sure that they look after it. It's a lovely thing for a child to be fascinated with. I know because I always was. Anyway, <laughs> back to my little box of goodies. This morning we went out and we picked these. And they oh. are, you see their snowdrops, and that's Galantha's Santa Claus. Oh, um, it's obviously out in time for Christmas. Uh, He's arrived early in your garden. Yes, it is very, <laughs> very early. Um, but they're lovely. No scent. At least I can't detect it anyway. Uh, <laughs> so, I mean, this is a Christmas treat in itself, show and tell, from Alan at East Ruston. It, well, yes, it is. But, you know, we still have some of these blooming. Now, these are in oh. pot in a cold greenhouse. And, of course, these are Noreen's or Norine's or say it how you will. But this is Noreen, um, Mrs. Fr Miss Frances Clark. And Ooh. these these ones are not quite hardy, but they're they're hardy enough to grow under cold glass. And the one thing about Noreen's is that quite often they'll have a crystalline um stripe on the on the petal. So that's a pale, pale pink one. But just look how those, those anthers come up and they sort of curl up. They look like a blast from a horn. If you could if you could draw a blast, you know, you blow a a, a horn and whoop, and that whoop, comes yeah out. and also we recorded a video a long time ago years ago um back when this video was more tutorials and plant profile this this channel was more uh tutorials and plant profiles and we called it floral fireworks because of course they're yeah. flowering at that uh fifth of november sort of time of year and they are they're, they're they are triumphant they're sort of they do look like a blast from a horn or a firework yeah, or something exactly celebratory. exactly and I was going through the greenhouse where these are the other day. And I mean, they're growing together with pelagoniums, no heat at all. Um, and the thing about them is that if you keep them dry at the root, I mean, I told you we've had minus three, so you know what kind of temperatures we've had. And incidentally, the top lights on that greenhouse are, are still open, though they get the ventilation. 
but there's pelargoniums in there and um, very very dry at the root but they're showing no signs of distress from the low temperatures i mean they're they're in dormancy at the moment so but anyway this is another one here i'll tell you the name of this in a minute but i mean you know there's a lovely selection of these to be had and if you want to if anybody's watching this and they'd like to acquire a few nerines the person to get in contact with is mr ed brown of Cotswold garden flowers because ed and his father um bob they have the national collection of nerines and he has the most wonderful selection of bulbs. Now, when you buy a bulb from Bob or Ed, it's probably going to be about £8.50 per bulb. And there's a reason for that. That's quite expensive. But there's a reason for that, and that is because they are quite slow to increase. But once you buy a single bulb and you keep it and you grow it, you'll find that next year you've probably got three in that pot, and the year after that there'll be five or six. Um, and so that, you know, it will gradually... It will... It will pay for itself. That initial outlay might seem rather hard, but, you know, the time will come when instead of just getting one flower in a pot, you'll get eight. Yeah. And so you have a lovely pan of flowers, um, which you can grow in a cold greenhouse without heat. So it's inexpensive, except for the fact you've got to have a cold greenhouse. But right, yeah. Yeah. You've got a cold greenhouse. Talking Lovely. of uses for unheated greenhouses, I saw a post from Steve Edney of the No Name Nursery the other day where he... Uh, and Lou, they they dig up their dahlias and they store them and they they pop them up and they label them and they do all of that at this end rather than you know storing them upside down or ever on a rack, which just because of the the amount of work that will be coming up when when dahlias are coming into growth, they've just potted them up now. They've got them in an unheated greenhouse, all lined up and labelled. If it gets really cold, they said they're going to cover them with some hessian. But yeah. I thought you know for busy gardeners, that was quite a, a a good tip really that you could do it that way and get the lion's share of the work out of the way at this end of the season or this end well, of the makes, sort of garden yes, it year. makes sense i mean we're, you know it gives you a break from raking leaves up doesn't it <laughs> <laughs> or whatever else you do pruning of course i mean that's another thing but um i think that um it's a very good thing to do that with dahlias the other thing that we do is we we always save our old potting compost so when we're repotting we have a, 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 a like a plastic hot big big thing you know that you carry around weeds in it and things like that but I, I all the old potting compost goes in there and I keep it and I use that to cover put dahlias in a box or a crate and I use that to cover them with for the winter and it's it's a race between sort of them r rotting and not rotting really um if you keep them too wet there's every danger that they might rot um and that's why when you dig a dahlia up dahlia tuber up or the whole you know the clump You've probably got about that much stem left on the dahlia. It's wise, if you can, to turn it upside down and leave it somewhere for about a week so that the moisture can drain out of those tops, of those um, old stems. Because if they sit there, if the moisture sits there, it could cause rotting. And, you know, when you dig your dahlias up, there, there's going to be some soil on them. In those, In that soil, there could be some slugs. You, you know, you can't go through and sort of sort everything. But, you know, if you if you let, if you leave those moist stem ends on the top of the dahlia, if they're very moist, the slugs will go to it and they'll start nibbling into the dahlias. And then the dahlia tuber will probably get nibbled and that mm -hmm. in will go the water and there's your rot starting. So it's yeah. it's important thing to try and do, try and keep them as dry as possible. Now, what else have I got? Oh, no. Excuse me, why, this is rather ungainly. <laughs> I'm quite excited about this one. I knew there was an un ungainly, quite special plant coming up. Well, yes. Um, this is... Uh, uh, I don't know whether... Oh, yes, you can. Oh, yes. That is the most fabulous leaf. It's an arum. It's not quite hardy. Um, this was given to me by Lionel Ponder, a great friend of me and the garden here. We exchange plants on a regular... Almost a weekly basis, I have to say. Um, and Lionel unfortunately had his greenhouse. He keeps it heated over the winter, but it it was um, his heater broken on that very cold night last year, oh, and he yeah. lost all his pelargoniums. But fortunately for him, I was able to replenish his pelargoniums. Ooh, that's not a slug; it's just a piece of mud. <laughs> <laughs> but that heron was called Primrose Warburg. Uh, Primrose Warburg was a plants woman, and she's probably most famous for her snowdrop called Primrose Warburg, which was named after her death. Um, and I think it was uh, John Grimshaw, who's another famous galanthophile, he curated her collection of snowdrops. She also collected crocus and she collected hellebores, amongst other things. 
in actual fact, I think she was a plantaholic. You know, if there's one plant that she liked anywhere and she thought it worth collecting, she would have it. Um, much like us all, I suppose. <laughs> um, but the Primrose Warburg, she was famous for her snowdrop lunches. She lived in Oxfordshire and at a, a house called South Hayes. Now, any galanthophiles listening to this, they will know that there's a, there's a snowdrop called South Hayes. Um, but I think primrose was one of the first yellow snowdrops, and the little bump at the back of the at the back of the bloom, um, which is this little bit here, the top, the green top there, on primrose Warburg, it was bright yellow, and there were yellow markings on the inside, and I think it's probably one of the first um, yellow snowdrops. And of course, yellow snowdrops have become um, exceedingly popular. In fact, there's uh, our dear friend Joe Sharman. He's introduced one last year. The golden please, and then golden tears. I mean, two yeah. now that have keep breaking the record on uh, how much. Yes, you they do. Pay for a snowdrop. <laughs> huge sums of money, um, and I say huge. I mean huge. But it has that kind of kick out, mm -hmm. petal, like trim. If you know what trim like, looks like, the little dab of green on it. Well, this is kick out petal with a little dab of yellow on it. I'm lucky enough to actually have that growing in the garden here, um, which somebody very kindly gifted me. Um, and I think I had five flowers last year, something to look forward to, you see, isn't it? I know exactly where it is. I just keep me, keeping my eyes peeled to see how many I get this year. Because <laughs> I was always sceptical about um, growing name varieties of snowdrops um, because I, I, I sort of had this kind of attitude that, well, snowdrops are just a snow, they're just a drift of white that you see in a n lovely natural woodland. And But thanks to our Victorian forebears, of course, they are in lots of big gardens. But this garden didn't have anything like that, so we had to start with our own. And we had we'd started with ordinary um, single and double snowdrops, which I mean, people get snobby about double snowdrops. They think, oh, they're gross. All those <laughs> pests packed in there. Oh, it's ugly. <laughs> take it away. <laughs> in natural fact, I mean, they they're all charming. The one thing about double snowdrops is they they stay open on a cold day because they're so packed with petals they can't do anything else. You know, it's like a crinoline skirt you know it, it's out there and you can't pack it down um they are the, like crinoline skirts they're yeah. brilliant <laughs> um, all those petticoats the, the the single ones they tend to sort of mm, look a little bit miserable perhaps on a very very cold day um and in actual fact if it gets very cold they can actually completely lay flat but they will come up again when the temperature rises so do they well much um, like errands which can be yes, completely ignored by the cold yeah. weather and then bing! yeah well as you see that's one of the things that people perhaps, I don't know, I think it's, I mean, the, you know, there is this group of people that put their garden to bed for the winter and they don't venture out. They probably look at it through the window like, like I'm doing here and they say, oh, look at those evergreens, aren't they lovely? <laughs> but, but they miss so much by not being in the garden. I mean, it, it's so good for you. It's good for your health, your mental health, your physical health. It's good for everything. Um, and, you know, you miss so much. You miss seeing creatures. You miss hearing the bird song. And there is bird song, believe it or not. Mm, yeah. You know, um, and you miss seeing the birds looking at their very, very best because they've got masses of this puffy plumage to keep them warm. And if you notice when birds roost, they kind of, sort of fluff the feathers out a little bit to trap the heat in their body. I wish I had a coat like that, you know. <laughs> Wouldn't it be You'd lovely? Be as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, what else have we got to add colour? Well, I'll tell you what. I was wandering through the vegetable garden and I couldn't resist picking oh. these. And this, uh, I mean, these are charred. And I mean, you know, regardless of whether you eat it or not, I mean, isn't that worth growing just for the colour alone? Look at those yeah. lovely colours, the rubies, the gold. There's green as well. I didn't pick green because I thought it'd be slightly boring, but just <laughs> look at the translucent of those stems. And I mean, they're just lovely to pick and put, put in the bars on the table on their own. And, then and if the glossy eating... leaf as well. I mean, the glossy leaf catching the light. Absolutely. Reflections. Yeah, look at that. Look yeah. At how cheerful and light reflecting they are. And if you get hungry, just pull a piece off and have a nibble. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I've been um, having a merry time popping up to the allotment and picking, uh, you know, coriander and petrol spinach and chard and things. And I know that you'd not like this, but popping it in a stir fry. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I, well, and I don't. Guacamole. <laughs> I don't do stir fries. I don't know why. I just they don't appeal to me at all. Um, <laughs> <I'm> not... <laughs> I, I tell you what was very interesting yesterday. There was a 
uh, something in the newspaper about foods that are coming back into fashion. And believe it or not, spuds are becoming fashionable again to eat. I mean, whatever form you whether a jacket potato, a baked potato, a roast potato, chips, mash, um, they're all becoming, and I think it's 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 based on the fact that they're relatively inexpensive. And in times of our times, when which we've got at the moment, um, you know, it, it's one of those vegetables that work very well. And sausages are coming back. Oh. Whether, whether they're vegetarian or whether they're, you know, meat-based. But I mean, sausages are very, very easy. And I tend to sort of do fiddle about with doing things with sausages with, well, for instance, I'll give you a little tip. Well, no, a little tip is just something we do. Um, but I take the sausages out of the skin, the sausage meat out of the skin, and I make little patties out of them, like little round cakes, and, and then I just flour them, and I fry them on each side, just to give them a little bit of colour, and I take them out, and then I make a flan base out of puff pastry, and then I line this flan base with, with some very finely chopped leeks. Um, I usually use some kind of chutney, and it's very nice with a rhubarb chutney, and you spread this all over the thing as well, and you tuck your, your little bits of... Um, uh, patties of sausage meat back in and you can cover it with whatever you want i mean this is infinitely variable recipe you you know to give it some seasoning cover it with a, um a, if you want but some kind of bechamel sauce on it or something like that you can and you bake it in the oven 15 20 minutes it's delicious and if you're if you're not too greedy you'll have a piece left for lunch the next day <laughs> unlikely with me around um <clears throat> Something my partner would be a big fan of. He, he, he will be delighted to hear sausages and potatoes are becoming fashionable because they are two of his favourite foodstuffs. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I was looking at the bedroom window the other day and I saw this haze of pink. And the haze of pink comes from this, oh. this really lovely sorbus, sorbus vilmarinii. And it, it look at those lovely pink porcelain, pink and white berries. They're absolutely lovely. That looks um, like something straight from a Christmas card, like a, a very nice. tasteful, yeah. subtle Christmas card that's not covered in glitter. I mean, I, I do like my fair share of, of eco glitter, uh, but that is absolutely beautiful. Each very blushing. Um, unfortunately, the birds have started to go for it now. So, um, <laughs> you know, they will. But, you know, growing plants like that in your garden, you really are helping wildlife. And the wildlife hasn't got to this yet, which I think is rose. And I think it is Rose Whitmore, but we're not absolutely sure. But it has these lovely flagon shaped bright orange hips and you can see them there. They pick beautifully. And I mean, you know, you don't need flowers. You don't need to go out and buy expensive flowers at Christmas time. You buy a few, pick a few sprigs from, from some um, uh, evergreen bushes that you might have in your garden and thread these, these throughout them. And they look absolutely lovely. Um, so many. I mean, if you're listening to the audio version of this, loads of quite small but lovely orangey red hips, a big cluster of them, you know, like 30, 40 all together. That's one head, you see, and that's yeah. a mass of little single white flowered roses. Um, uh, lovely in their season, which is probably July into August. And then it produces these lovely hips. So you get two, bri two bites of the cherry or hip, if you like. Um, <laughs> and... <laughs> But, you know, you can see, you, don't waste these and throw them away, though. Look, leave them outside because the birds will come and take them. I made a, a holly, holly wreath for my front door a couple of years ago, and I thought I'd be very smart and very clever. And I bought, I um, mean, it's uh, Ilex verticillata, which is a deciduous holly. So all you get is the red berries on the stems and it's packed with them. They come from, I think they probably came from America. Um, and Ilex villata, verticillata grows in a kind of brackish water, very boggy sort of places. Um, and so I can't grow it here because I'm too dry. But anyway, I made this wreath and I went out the door one day and I shut the door behind me and looked at my wreath admiringly, as you do. And I looked at it and I thought, those berries are going from the top. And the birds were starting at the top and they went all the way down. <laughs> so by Christmas Day, the nay, there was near a berry to be seen. It was completely um, denuded, but I'd done my bit for the wildlife, so... Talking about hollies, here we segue, have... Segway, segway. In, indeed. Well, you don't get old without getting up for. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is a lovely little holly. It's, I don't know whether you can appreciate, well, you can if I get the other one, because, you know, there's a great deal of difference in hollies. Look at that. Wow. <laughs> yes. Between those two. And I mean, even in the hue of the berries, can we get a bit more light on that? 
But we can see one much brighter red, one more yes. of the yeah. sort of rubyish, yeah, clarity, merlot-y colour. Well, this is a good trust you say that. <laughs> <laughs> That's just a few of my favourite things. <laughs> <laughs> this is a holly called Nellie Stevens, and I'm training two of these. I've got them on my front doorstep at the moment, but they don't look terribly clever. But I'm training them up into standard columns. Um, so they're just going to be very narrow columns. And I thought, that, you know, with these small berries and the small stature of, of the, the leaves and everything else, it will be quite dense. And in future years, hopefully they will look even more spectacular than they do today. But Nellie Stevens is a very good burying holly but do bear in mind you have to have a male to go with the female the female produces the berries obviously but you need a male nearby to, if you're going to get cross-pollination um in my garden i've got lots of males well i would have wouldn't i um, <laughs> <laughs> but and, and you know lots of self-seeding hollies this is not a self-seeded holly this is um a, a variety called ilex castanifolia um, and it's chestnut. It's called the chestnut leaf holly because this leaf here resembles the leaves you get on a sweet chestnut, not a horse chestnut, a sweet chestnut. And this originally came to the garden from, um, oh, this is going to sound terribly posh, but I was we were at Ravening Hall one day when um, the late Lady Bacon, Dowager Lady Bacon, was still alive. And um, her name was Priscilla. And Priscilla and I knew each other. for We'd known each other for years. I used to help her in the garden sometimes many, many years ago. And uh, we saw this holly and Graham said, well, what's that? And she said, well, it's holly. And she said, it's interesting because it's castanifolia. Um, and because it's got these leaves like a horse, uh, sweet chestnut, I mean. And she said, take some bits. And Graham said, well, is it the right time? And she said, young man, it's the right time if you're offered it. And I thought that's, I mean, Christopher Lloyd always said, you know, yeah, I don't worry about doing jobs, whether it's the right time or not. You know, I do it when I see it because at least it gets done. Otherwise, it probably will be missed. Um, and so, you know, you make your best of it. And hollies come quite easily. They're very slow, but they come easily from cuttings, especially in the winter. So if you want to increase your holly, I mean, take a take a cutting um and do it do a, what they call a hardwood cutting i'm not going to tell you how to do that now we haven't got time but you <laughs> you can look it up on the internet there's lots of um very helpful um youtube things to show you how to do it but i think that's absolutely stunning that's castanifolia and the berries on that absolutely it makes quite a big plant it grows probably 20 25 feet tall so it makes quite a big plant but you know so, it, it deserves to be a spike of berries as well Oh, yes, you know, this cluster of berries is is so present and beautiful. Yeah, yeah, that is absolutely amazing. I think that that's splendid, and I think that yes, that's all for my box of tricks. Actually, <laughs> uh, I, I, I haven't exhausted everything, but to, don't forget Nellie Stevens. Um, I don't know how common Nellie Stevens is, but I mean I've seen it around quite a lot, so that's a very nice one to get if you if you're short of space because you can clip it um, and keep it nice and tidy. And her leaves are so shiny, her berries so bright and red, she almost doesn't look real on the screen. She no, almost looks like not. a decoration. Yes, yes. But Wonderful. It's no good having a holly with three berries on the stalk. You've got to have a holly, <laughs> you've got to have a sprig with, you know, laden with berries. And, and of course, you have a um, you have a yellow berried holly at East Ruston, don't you? I mean, yeah. obviously, you have a yellow berried one, but you have your own yellow berried one. Yeah, we, well, the, yeah, thank you for mentioning that. There was, it was, um, it, we had the holly expert called Susan Andrews, S U S Y N, Susan Andrews here, and she was staying with um, the late Peter Boardman, who had that, um, a lovely holly collection over at Ludham, about five miles from us. And um, he said, Would you mind if Susan came and looked at the garden? I said, No, not at all, of course, come around. And this is the, the kind of thing that happens in the gardening world. You know, if you if, if they're going to somewhere they and you've got an interesting garden, someone will ring up and suddenly say, well, can I come and have a look? As Cleve West did one Sunday morning. Um, and, you know, of course, well, I'd be honoured to have people like that in the garden. Anyway, Susan saw this yellow-berried holly and she said, where did that come from? I said, it was a seedling that we found in the garden here. And she said, well, we must name it. What should we call it? Um, and I said, well, if you think it's worthy, oh, of course it's worthy. Look at this, 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 all the plus points about it. And so she called it East Rust and Gold. So we have a, a holly named after the garden, which I think is rather lovely. 
because I have a snowdrop named after me now, as you know, because you presented yes. it. Yes, the immortal Alan Gray. <laughs> You're like, that didn't was the name of <laughs> Oh dear, yeah. But no, so you they're... must be excited to see. I mean, Alan, Alan Gray, the snowdrop, will be. Uh, I'm assuming you know making its its peripherous appearance at some point. Yes, it will be flowering in um, probably about uh, from somewhere in the middle of February, uh, early to mid February. It should be doing its stuff. We I bought this is dreadful, isn't it? But this is what happens to you. I mean, Val <laughs> Borg will, will she she will attest to this, I think, because. This is what happens to you. Once a galanthophile gets hold of you, you know, they, this instills in you, well, that's a different one, that's a different one, that's a different one. I tend to go for the bigger growing snowdrops. I do like them if they're taller and they've got uh, more presence. Um, whilst, I mean, dare I say it, the ladies often go for the tinier ones. Um, and, I mean, the late Anne Borrell, she um, had a most wonderful collection of snowdrops, and I was able to give her a variety called Green Tear which was all the rage a few years ago. She, alas, she's no longer with us. But she had a, a snowdrop named after her. And I said, she, was, she said, have you seen this one? I said, it's called Penelope Ann. She said, it's called Penelope Ann. I said, well, who's she? She said, that's me. <laughs> said, well, I didn't know your name was Penelope. So thereafter, I called her Penelope. <laughs> <laughs> I used to get cross, but she, never mind. But she had a wonderful collection of lovely miniatures. <laughs> Um, miniature narcissa and things like that. And I said, you know, and it's, it's wonderful, but, you know, how did you get this collection together? And she said, it's not what you know, is it? And by that, she meant that she mixed in the circles of those sort of people that probably they, grow, they grew plants that were not in general cultivation for various reasons, but mainly because they don't bulk up quickly enough and they're, you know, they're fiddly to do and they're awkward and they're, done, they're grown by enthusiasts who will then pass them on to another enthusiast who in turn will, and so on and so forth. Um, and that is how you acquire some of the most interesting plants that, you, that you'll get. And, and of course, you know, if you go to plant fairs and snowdrop days and, and things like that, you will always find something interesting. OK, there'll be the big boys like Joe Sharman there with every kind of snowdrop you can think of, plus a few other lovely things, because he has a, a, a box, a dressing up box full of treasures to bring. Yeah. But you will also find hobby growers there who probably, um, they, you know, they, they want to earn a few pennies to go towards the cost of the garden or buying even yet more snowdrops or something, whatever. Um, but, you know, these, from these people, these little enthusiasts, don't forget Brian Ellis in, in this, because Brian Ellis is an enthusiast about not just snowdrops. I will have yeah. you know. Everything, Lots. really. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, well, the thing about Brian is Brian and, and David, they don't have a huge garden. But what they do have, they have a jewel box. Um, and it, it it's absolutely packed with all the sorts of unusual plants that he's got from his contacts. And these are people that he... Thank you very much, Sally. It's very kind. Sally's just brought <laughs> coffee. <laughs> you'll have to you'll have to meet Sally one day. She's very nervous. She won't want to come and sit and, and put a face on the screen. But we'll see what we can do. I'll, I'll, I'll take a quick photograph when she's not looking. <laughs> the, the plant um, the plant community. I mean, Brian Brian Ellis is is one of the most generous plants people I know. Uh, Dean Croucher in Somerset as well. Wonderful yeah. garden to follow on Instagram. And um, we had this joke that Fiola was due on Dean's birthday, and he said, "Well, if you manage to have your baby on my birthday, I'll send you a special snowdrop." And uh, blow me down. Not only did Fiola turn up on his due date, so on Dean's birthday, um, but he also <laughs> sent me not just one but several special snowdrops which i live in fear won't show up because i've had so little time to look after my garden can, uh, I, just, year, so. can I just interject there and say <laughs> and say one thing that is just what they like they don't want to be fiddled with they want to be neglected um because you know if you think about it snowdrops do their growing and their flowering at, at a very at the very time when other plants are not and you know if you can if you can actually grow bulbs like snowdrops or scillas or crocus, um, and all of those things that naturally grow in woodland, bluebells, you know they they get their growing done just as the leaves are coming out on the trees. Um, so they they have all the light, and 
they push their leaves up and they're able to do the photosynthesis and everything else and build up their bulbs and make their seeds and everything. And then suddenly the canopy gets dark and they go into what they absolutely love, which is this period of, um, well, how shall I say, it's not dryness, it's, it's this kind of moist, even temperature. They don't like these huge heats and huge, huge mm. cold, you know, they, they tolerate cold, of course. Um, but, you know, this lovely even temperature and they go to bed for the summer. I wouldn't want to do that, but I wouldn't mind going to bed <laughs> for the winter, I tell you. <laughs> I wouldn't mind just having some sleep, to be honest, but that's, a, that's another story um, <laughs> for another day. It, the natural world does blow my mind. I think that just the, 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 the equilibrium, the balance, the cycle, all of that, you know, how amazing it is that all of these plants are waiting for the leaves to disappear so they can have their moment and they go away again and a whole yeah. new chapter uh, yeah. of the gardening year continues on. It's, um, it's, it's wonderful. So inspiring. Well, I mentioned you, you saw um, Aaron Primrose Wahlberg, and not not quite hardy, but it makes such a wonderful plant. And there's a lady who lives in in uh, Sutton, just a few miles down the road. Um, she used to be um, a wonderful exhibitor of alpine plants, and she grew that Primrose Wahlberg Aaron in a pot in a cold greenhouse because it doesn't like huge amounts of cold. Um, in actual fact, Lionel, who gave it to me, said he planted it in his garden and lost it twice. Um, I'm determined when my plant gets bigger to prove him wrong, but we shall see. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there, there's, there's that area, it produces its leaves in the winter. So it starts coming into growth probably in August, September. You'll see the new leaves coming through. And there's a huge range of uh, arum, um that well, Joe Sharman grows a lovely selection with mottled leaves, patterned leaves, variegated yellow leaves, splish splashed, or even, you know, there's such wonderful things. And I've bought from him over the years, quite a few. And I love them in the winter for their foliage. Incidentally, Gertrude Jekyll grew them in her garden. I don't know that she had terribly sophisticated kinds, but she used to yank the whole bunch of leaves off the top of the corn or bulb plonk it into a vase and she poked daffodils between it. And that was what she she used as her, excuse me, her greenery. Uh, so that was wonderful. Um, but these plants, I mean, for me, they are very neglected because they're there in the winter time. Now, lots of people say that, oh, they run all over the place. They don't really run, they, they seed all over the place and they can be a nuisance. But I mean, if you garden, you edit where necessary. And if you garden like me, you probably leave the seedlings for two years. So then you get the true colour of the leaves and you'll see that they are either good or not. If they're not good, you just yank them out or put fork underneath and get rid of them. Um, but if they're good, you keep them. And, and now we've got some wonderful, <coughs> very beautifully marked leaves coming up at the bottom of hedges where the birds have taken the berries to the top and they've eaten the hedges and eaten berries and the through the hedge comes the seed, if you see what I mean. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and um, they germinate and you know hedge bottoms are very interesting places because an awful lot of seedlings will develop in hedge bottoms and if you're looking for some self-sown seedlings of something like you not you why you, <laughs> you trees um honeysuckle is another one that frequently gets um, seen at the bottom of hedges and trachycarpus fortunii the chosen palm because we grow that here in the garden and you need male and female again to get berries. Um, and the berries, they're huge panicles of this of olive green berries. Fantastic sight. We sometimes saw one off and put it in the middle of a table just as decoration on its own for Christmas. It's lovely. Um, but birds take the fruit when they're ripe and they sit on tops of the hedges, as I just said, and they drop the seed and you get all these palm trees growing in your in your hedge bottom. So, you know, if you're when you're gardening, just have a look in the hedge bottoms and see what there is. We've got a, an abutilon, which is really then, well, I say they're not hardy, but this abutilon, it's on the south facing wall, but it's been there for the past, well, we we built the garden in 28, 9, 10, 11, opened it in 2012. And I think it was from the original planting in 2012, so it's 11 years. And it's been there for 11 years. It's a, it's a red bell shaped, large flower abutilon. It's been knocked back from the top, you know, it gets frosted a little bit, you trim it up and then off it goes again. But this year it actually has two self-sown seedlings beneath it. Now they're probably likely to be exactly the same as the mother because, but then of course it must have been able to be pollinated by something else 
or was it or was it self-pollination who knows <laughs> it'd be interesting to see I'm, I'm i must dig up those seedlings and grow them on because next year i shall know if they flower which they should do i shall know whether they're going to um be hardy or not yeah what color are they going to be which is more important there's a, a new race of abutilans um and they're a cross between large flowered hybrids and the small flower megapotanicum and the megapotanicum is the one with the little heart-shaped flowers and the lovely sort of dark red calyx on the top and um these are charming because they're much smaller flowered than the large flower but the big plus point about them is that they are much hardier and there's a lovely lemon one called ellen's little bird which <laughs> i <I've got. laughs> And um, and then there's Garda Gardaman's red, which is more of an orangey red, small flower one. There's a pink one called something party or princess or something. I'm not sure. Pink princess or pink something. I got that as well. And I took lots of cuttings of these last winter and uh, last autumn. And, and they're in the propagating house at the moment and they're growing along quite strongly. So I'm looking forward to seeing them. Um, but I'm also testing them in the garden to see how hardy they are because they do have this increased hardiness. And I've got Gardamon's Red in a pot, a big pot in my back courtyard outside the kitchen door. And that at the moment has been completely unaffected by the frost. And by next door to it, I had a fuchsia called Fuchsia Boliviana, which is the very long, slender, dark red flowers, very glamorous. And that is a, a lovely thing, but immediately the frost gets into the soft tips of the foliage, it curls up and, the, you know, the, the, the yeah. dead life. But the thing is, you know, Fuchsia Boliviana will quite often come back from below ground level, but don't bother with it because it comes back, but it doesn't start flowering then until September or even October. And you're just a few weeks away from Dame Nature doing her damnedest to put the stuff <laughs> campus on the summer garden and so you know unless you can bring your plants through the winter it, it's probably not worth growing outside but the abutilons i think probably will be and you know it's all about this sort of increasing the amount of interest that we have in our gardens throughout the year and i think that the the smaller flowered abutilons on quite small plants well i say small but a meter a meter and a half tall that's not quite big but you know for the smaller garden for a shrub border or a border they are absolutely stonking i think yeah, I'm getting so much inspiration. Uh, we should squeeze in some FLOMO before we have to bid farewell to this uh, podcast for 2023. We will, of course, return in 2024. Um, but FLOMO, that fear of missing out, you get about a flower or a plant. My I've got garden... the ideal thing for that. <laughs> <laughs> my, my, uh, my garden is definitely lacking in a lot of evergreens, mostly because I get obsessed with, you know, I want that, I want that, I want that. And then you put all yes. the plants in. Yes. That's all I I really should have thought this through. So, I, I mean, I have some nice autumn colour and I do have a bit of evergreen. Like just looking out there, I'm always amazed by how Chilean glory vines survive yeah. in frosts and things. They're, they've just done so well. And I little seedlings turn up all the time. I, every year I mean to get the Tresco mix so that I have different colours than just the red one, which I've all, you know, I've had since I first moved in and introduced it. I, I would love to have a variety of oranges and creams and things so yeah. one day I, I will next garden maybe I will do that um but I I those your hollies I think your castanefolia your your one with the what was it called Nellie Stevens Nellie Stevens also what a great name <laughs> Nellie Stevens um I do wish we'd called Lily the dog Nellie that's such a great name <laughs> next dog um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but yeah, they they both really really inspiring. My original FOMO before we started talking about all these things was was nothing so serious, but it did seem apt for a celebratory time of year, and also with all of the you know bulb catalogs and bulb sales, you know landing in your email inbox or whatever. Um, I keep seeing and have done for a couple of years now the alley and party balloons, and I don't I've never seen party balloons in real life. I do like the stupid name. Um, and I do like the fact that it's supposed to be multi-flowered. Um, so whether or not I will ever succumb and buy it, I've been trying to just not give myself extra gardening jobs because I just don't have time at the moment. But I, every time I see it, I think, oh, well, have I got the space for it? I have to be careful how I plant them because I cannot stand with allium foliage that's gone over and is looking nasty. So it has it to be planted. Comes. <laughs> it has to be planted carefully and it was either you or Eastern Wall Gardens who said to plant it amidst my 
uh, Stachis, Byzantinus, my lambs here, which was genius because that's what I've done with Netroscordums, Alliums, and you just don't get irritated by the foliage then. But I haven't obviously got a lot of garden to do that with. So I haven't got it. Every time I see it, I think, shall I get it? Have you got party balloons? No. <laughs> no, I'm going to get it. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like it could be, you know, they're, they're relatively expensive bowls. It just sounds like it could be faddy and not very good. I do I do love my standard Christophe eyes and my Schiberti eyes and my purple sensations. But whether or not I branch out one of these days and get party balloons and see if it's up to the hype, I don't know. Well, we've got several different new ones this year, um, but I know what you mean. It, 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 uh, but nerines, uh, not nerines, sorry, uh, alliums, they have this habit of just as their flowers are coming, flowers, scapes are coming out, the foliage starts to wither. And that is the one drawback. And the one thing that Christopher Lloyd always says, you know, they, they're they great for planting in amongst emerging perennials. So if you've got lupins or delphiniums yeah. that cover up that horrible foliage and also planting at the front of a border, because if you've got... Plants like um, like viola, viola cornuta, or something like that, or indeed your lambs, lambs lugs. You know, yeah, that just helps to disguise it. And it is, it is a nuisance. I do agree with you. That's one. Of the, that is the one drawback. And I was just thinking when you said about evergreens, if you've got anywhere on your allotment where you've got a particular area that's very windy, I mean, if the wind comes from, I mean, predominantly from the southwest, I suppose, probably or westly, with southwestly, but wherever you've got a little bit, I mean, you just put a few evergreens in there. Yeah. Um, so that could mean you, you have instant picking material for little winter posies, if you like. That is a genius idea. I mean, I've always, I planned to and haven't got around to just lining out hardwood cuttings and things at the allotment. Yeah. But that, I, I, I need to need to get on with that. <laughs> yeah, but, I mean, you could even start your evergreens off with hardwood cuttings. Yeah. <laughs> cuttings in the winter, put them too close together because, you know, some won't take, some will perhaps. Um, my Flomo is... Good old fashioned garden flocks. Now you may think that you know the herbaceous garden flocks, uh, flocks paniculata and their and varieties of that. You might think that that's a common old thing, but we've noticed in the garden here, um, and visitors have noticed that you somehow it's suddenly not available anywhere, not in great quantities anyway. And I've sourced two varieties that I think are particularly nice, um, but they're not for small gardens, I have to say. But there are a numerous numerous varieties of flocks available from a well-known bulb supplier called Farmer Gracie. Yeah. And if you look, Farmer Gracie's catalogue for summer flowering bulbs was launched online two days ago. And my fear of missing out on these flocks was <laughs> such that I banged an order in straight away. <laughs> what I did was, I mean, you you know, they're they're not and they're not hugely expensive. I mean they I mean I think probably for a the very the rare flocks, which is a Her Hercules and Goliath, purple and a pink. And I mean, Hercules is probably the tallest one, or it might be Goliath, I'm not sure. But I mean, one's purple and one's pink. And it is five or six feet tall. It is that big, well grown, of course, and huge heads, pink blossom on, like a like a big blousy hydrangea, I suppose, in a way, but herbaceous. Um, and I just sort of had to have some of these. Um, <clears throat> so if Eric sees this podcast, um, he will know who he, he is. Uh, Eric is always <laughs> talking about flocks and uh, nephophias, which he calls fophias. <laughs> no, nophias, nophias. <laughs> um, and the two plants that he likes, and he's always taking note of the flocks that are growing in the garden and dropping rather large hints that I should dig them up and divide them so he can buy them from me. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, sometimes you don't get around to doing that. But I've got these new ones coming, so we're going to line them out in the stock borders and grow them on for a couple of years just to assess them and see how they do. Um, and then we will, you know, branch out into... Did I mention that we've got a new trial I mean, coming to the oh, garden? Oh, your um, your uh, ginger trial. Yeah, hedichiums. Hedichiums, hedichiums. I think we've got... Um, well, Karen, who runs it with the RHS, she got in touch the other day um, and she said that um, she hopes we'll have between 90 and 100 varieties. It depends on what's available and what people have got. But the national collection holder who lives down on the south coast has got is helping a great deal. And I don't know whether they'll get where they're going to get the rest from. But, you know, we will have them here. And we've got local people on the judging 
panel as well. We've got Jane Ann Walton, who we know, um, <clears throat> Richard, who was on the podcast a few weeks ago. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, Richard a Clark. Yeah, he's going to be on it. Um, Richard Van Egmond is going to be on it. He's got a wholesale nursery and great friend from Lincolnshire. Um, and Ian Roof. I have persuaded Ian Roof that he should do it as well, because um, you know, these are all plants people. You don't need a qualification, but if you if you've got sufficient knowledge of plants, you can you can actually give your opinion. And it really is just an opinion as to you know which we think is best. And they they will be judged on a monthly basis. You know, we have a meeting here. Everybody arrives and gathers for coffee, and then we have they go go off and do their thing. Well, yes, this is a very good one, you know. <laughs> Uh, ticking boxes and all that and then we compare notes at the end over lunch so it's a very civilized thing but it, it will come so that when the rhs does these trials it does them with the aim of finding the best varieties and when the best varieties are announced they're probably given the agm the award of garden merit and if you see a plant that's got the award of garden merit you will know that it has been trialed by the rhs and has deservedly won that award for good points so AGM generally means a good plant. <laughs> <laughs> there we are, a good weed. <laughs> and it'll be very exciting for those of us who are keen to uh, to grow more hedicums to to get some more sort of info about which ones are our best. So yeah, well, all the very. Thing, the other thing that they are very interested in is the the hardiness of the of, of yeah. um, hedicums, and so that's going to be one of the big criteria as well. Yeah, um, a couple of things. One of them is uh, you're talking about Farmer Gracie. They're probably sold out by now, but I did see they'd reduced their Muscari Camosum in their sort of sale of bulbs. And if anyone hasn't grown them, um, we they came up as a Flomo, I think possibly when we were talking to Jane Ann Walton ages ago on this podcast. You very kindly sent me some and I grew them in a couple of different places in my front garden in a container at the foot of the fig and uh, over uh, in the kind of general planting. Makes it sound like I have such a big area <laughs> it's like a little postage stamp um but they they almost sort of rested for a year but since then they have been such good doers and they're fabulous they're muscari great piercings but with these sort of almost like a candelabra on top they're wonderful they're they they're the kind of plant they're kind of flower that looks like it should have googly eyes on it or something they're such good characters <laughs> so if you do get the chance to to grow them i heartily recommend them i think they're fantastic uh, and the other thing i wanted to say is a certain something arrived in the post with a <laughs> do not do not open until Christmas. Does it say that? It does. It says do not oh, open until David Christmas. Wheeler. David Wheeler must have put that on because I said I was going to buy that for you for Christmas, a Christmas subscription to Hortus magazine. Yeah. So thank you. We I talked you, I about bet you'll, I bet you'll open it before Christmas. Trying so hard not to. We put it under the tree. <laughs> I can't imagine I'll manage to wait. If I get a quiet period before Christmas, I'm going to seize my opportunity to read while I can. But yeah, if you didn't catch our Talking Dirty episode with David Wheeler, editor of Hortus, it did come up that um, I currently don't have a subscription because of the baby. Uh, so uh, I, I hinted that perhaps, well, I say hinted, I basically flat out asked if I could perhaps have one for Christmas. So thank you very much. <laughs> Well, I'm glad, I'm glad it's arrived and you've got something to look forward to. I really have. Many, many things to look forward to, not least uh, regrouping in 2024 for uh, an update on how it's all been going at East Ruston. Fingers crossed, no more brutal frosts, but we'll have to see what's uh, what's around the corner. Until next year, Merry Christmas. Thank you very much yeah. to everybody for all of the support you've given us, all your wonderful comments. We very rarely get the chance to ever reply to anything, but we read and treasure every single one. So thank you for your support. Thank you for all our wonderful guests. And Alan, thank you very much for being such a hoot and for sharing such wonderful knowledge and an array of flomotastic plants over the last year. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's, it's been this is an absolute pleasure. I mean, you know, you, when you get so much pleasure out of, you know, being in your garden, gardening, doing it, I get more pleasure out of doing it than I do sitting in it, I have to say. <laughs> but, but, you know, that it's it's just lovely to do. So, no, thank you, too. It's And, and thank you to everybody that's listening and, and, and supporting us, because, you know, it's nice to know that you're there. Um, and um, anybody that has any ideas, if they'd like us to talk about something, do give us, um, give, get in touch and give us a few ideas because, you know, we, we do what we think, but there might be something that somebody wants to talk about that could suddenly take off and be a real, well, showstopper. <laughs>
uh, th there have been many podcasts which have been suggested guests, uh, etc. So we're always very, uh, very grateful for your input. And I can't wait to see what 2024 has in store. So until then, I suppose, happy gardening. And happy Christmas, everybody. Nice to see Merry you. Merry Christmas. <laughs> Hello, I'm having some issues. Oh, I've only got a tiny little picture of you. Just don't, I don't understand it. Is, is there so many, you know, like if you're trying to find something in the supermarket and there are too many options. <laughs> uh, should we just record it like this? I think <laughs> I'm, I'm happy if you are. <laughs> are you talking? <laughs> oh. I'm I'm thinking. <laughs> Slightly sharper than usual, but that's not yes. you know. Where's my soft focus gone? <laughs> Hello oh, where's my camera? It's over there. <laughs> Hello and welcome. <laughs> more light, Mr. Demel, please. More light. <laughs> <laughs> right. Holly named after the garden, which I think is rather lovely. Um, and of course, I'm. I'm uh, yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> Are you I'm being very, offered uh, a beverage? I am being offered a beverage. <laughs> <laughs>